Well, hello again. Uh, it was my junior year of high school. I was really good at two very specific things on the soccer team uh, where I played. I was great at getting all of the starters ready for the for the game that was coming up that week. I was really good at that. And then I was also very good at warming up a very specific spot on the bench uh, that whole entire year. Uh, but that year, uh, we played a team that was absolutely incredible. It's a team that is always really incredible. Uh, we are preparing for a game against Marquette High School, who, of course, is usually number one in the state. Um, sometimes they're even one of the best teams in the country. That particular year, they were ranked number one in the whole entire country. And so we had about a week to go before we were going to play Marquette. And we walk into our locker room on a Monday morning, getting ready for practice after school. And there on the board are these three words. It says, we beat Marquette. Those three words were on the board, which we all thought was really, really weird because we had not played Marquette yet. And so we were looking around at each other. We were wondering, who must have written this? And so in our, our coach comes in a few minutes, and he comes in, and he starts telling us about not, not how we are good enough to beat Marquette, not about how we could possibly do it if everything went right in the game, but how it, it had already happened. We beat Marquette are those words that were on there. Uh, our coach was also a teacher uh, in the school, and so when we'd see him throughout the week, he would not greet us with a normal greeting. He would look at us. He'd be like, Gruber, hey, we beat Marquette. We would go with each other. He told us to start saying it to one another. So even though it's really difficult to get high school boys to all come together and do something, he somehow convinced us that when we greet each other this week, you greet each other not like, hey, let's practice hard or let's do well. He said, you, you greet each other. We beat Marquette. How many of you went to Marquette High School? Some of you. Yeah, I was going to say, some of you. It's a compliment because if you're used as an illustration about how awesome you are, it's a compliment. Uh, so we did. It was the last thing we said as we got off the bus that night to go play them. We went to Marquette. We got off the bus, and he said, hey, guys, remember, we beat Marquette. And so that is what happened. We went out on the field, and yes, I had nothing to do with it, but yes, the team, we did beat Marquette that night. It was a huge, awesome thing. Yeah, you don't need to cheer at all, because I had nothing to do with it. I had nothing to do with it. Uh, I stayed really warm. It was a really cold night. Um, but there's something about that. There's something about having somebody in our life who knows us, who knows what we're capable of, who knows how we've been wired, who knows our strengths and weaknesses, look at us and tell us, I can see something in you. You can't see it in yourself. And, and I love the way that he put this. It, it's because he didn't tell us, like, you could be this. He said, you already are that. You already are, already are that. It, it was weird because it was the first time in my life that I legitimately had no doubt in my mind. I knew that their players were incredible. We played club soccer with a lot of those guys. They had several Division I players on their team. They were fast. They were ruthless. They were incredible at what they did. And, and we were good, too. We just weren't at the same level as them. But something in my mind, having somebody who knew me and not saying, I believe that maybe you could do it, but saying, no, you already have done it, made all the difference for me where I legitimately had no doubt in my mind what the outcome of the game was going to be. I already knew we beat them. It was so convinced. It's true in sports, this type of mentality. You know, we try to grasp this sort of mentality. Professional sports teams are always trying to grasp this kind of mentality. So if you heard Aaron Rodgers a couple weeks ago, yeah, they're doing horrible, right? And after a game, one of their defensive players is being interviewed and talks about, well, if we lose next week. So a reporter mentions that to Rodgers after the game. He said, well, you know, one of your players, he's talking about if you lose next week, and Rodgers stops him in his tracks, and he says, we don't even talk about that. We don't even entertain that kind of thinking. And now some of us kind of laughed at Rogers and we're like, what's wrong with you? Well, he, he knows the secret. He knows the secret that my coach taught us, which was you have to already believe that it's done before you even do it. It's that reality that's true in sports. It's actually true in your relationships too. What, what you believe about the relationships you are in totally defines how that relationship's going to go. It's true about your job. It's true about really almost every aspect of your life. It's that old quote from Henry Ford that you definitely know, that whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. 
It's that old saying. And, and the Apostle Paul in this moment in the book of Romans, which we've been going through the book of Romans for a while, uh, at this particular moment, he stops and he's speaking to the entire congregation. Now, you'll remember, the congregation was made up of Jewish people and made up of non-Jewish people. And so part of the trick of the book of Romans is trying to figure out who he's talking to at each different moment of the book of Romans. But now it's like he's gotten done saying all this stuff. And he takes a step back. And he's talking to the whole entire congregation. And he tells them a few different things. Because they have two completely different ways of seeing the world. I think sometimes we skip over this. We don't realize just how different this congregation in, in Rome was. They had two different ways of seeing the world. They had two completely different customs. Think about your holidays, right? The schedule of holidays. This is how my calendar year goes. You know, two different ways of living in the world. Uh, but because the gospel, which was good news, that's literally what it means. Gospel means good news. Because it was good news for everyone in the church of his day, it, was also, it also is good news for everybody in this room here today as well, regardless of your background, regardless of your story. And so now Paul has finally, finally finished saying what he wants to say in this letter to the church in Rome. And now he's speaking to the whole community again. And he starts out by saying this. This is in uh, verse 14 uh, of chapter 15. He says, I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. Now, Paul said a lot of tough things to the church in Rome, uh, but here he's speaking as like a good father or a good coach. And think about it again. If somebody knows you and they see something in you and they call it out in you, it means a lot. And so he said they're full of goodness, they're filled with knowledge, they're competent to instruct one another. And, and that's one thing when it comes from somebody who knows you. So if, an example is in my life, I, you know, I play different instruments. I've taught different students saxophone and guitar over the years. And there's something that happens. I know some of you te uh, are also music teachers, but even if you're not, think about if you've ever taught a young person someone or something. Usually it doesn't take very long. It only takes a lesson or two. It only takes a time or two. And if a kid has potential where you can see, you can already kind of see into the future for them. You can kind of tell like immediately. I remember one particular student that I had that she started playing and she just learned one chord, and I, I knew that if she stuck with it, she could be a great songwriter. And so part of my job was then, yes, to teach her all these technical skills about music, but also to keep her believing in herself, right? Believing, like, you could be great. You could be amazing. I, I see it in you. Now, now think about it. That's great when a teacher sees that in, in a student, but that's not Paul, is it? Paul's never been to the church in Rome. None of Paul's colleagues had been there as far as we know. This is a church community that he is writing a letter to. Think of how different the letter of 1 Corinthians is from Romans. Because 1 Corinthians, Paul had been so integral into that church. He could, he could really like cut to the core with them. And yet this is a very different church. And so why does Paul say these words? Why does he say that I know you're full of goodness? You're filled with knowledge. I know you're competent to instruct one another. Why does he say it? He says it because he knows who lives in them. Now think about this. Paul had this intimate relationship with the Spirit of God. I mean, just go read Paul's letters. It becomes crystal clear immediately that Paul knows God. You know, we should recognize that right away. And so he's got this relationship with the Spirit of God. He's, he's not just telling them something encouraging just to tell them something encouraging. He's got a relationship with the Spirit, and he knows that the Spirit is the same Spirit that lives in them. And, and so that's why he says it. He believes in them, but not in the sense that he thinks that they're talented. He doesn't even know them personally. Rather, he's confident that they are capable. They're capable of allowing the Spirit of God to flow through them to work in their community and to actually flow through the whole entire community. He, he knows that they have everything that they could possibly need. It reminds me of a time in seminary. I took an open book test. How many of you have taken an open book test before? Aren't those the best? 
Open book tests are great. Well, this was a kind of a tricky open book test because my professor in seminary told us that she was going to have these incredibly high standard for us. Like, you have to do perfectly. In fact, it was going to be a long form test. You had to write out in paragraph form a couple pages for each question. And you need to be able to cite your sources as you go. So that's a lot of work. And she said, I'm going to expect you to do this incredible job. So on the one hand, it was this huge hurdle. Like, we have to be able to know what we're talking about, know where to find it, know where, how to cite it, know how to be able to do all of this stuff. But she said, at the same time, it's completely open book. You have open access to everything you could possibly need. You can bring all of your books in. You can bring all of your notes in. You basically have three hours to use whatever you need and to answer all of this. Now, the trick was... She gave us not, the, not only the questions on the test, she actually gave us 30 questions, and she said eight of these questions will be on the test. It's just such a brilliant way to teach people how to learn something, isn't it? Because she, what she forced us to do is spend about a month researching 30 questions. And by the end of all of that, we really knew our stuff, didn't we? But So it's that sense of there's this huge huge um, thing that we have to jump over, this, this huge thing that we have to accomplish. The standards are so high. However, simultaneously, what we, what we need to accomplish it, we have access to all of it. We have access to all of it. And, and I think that that's why Paul is saying that he's confident in them. Think about life. Life right now, for you, it's tricky. It's not clear. There are so many pitfalls that you could, you could go into in your life that would be the wrong course for your life. There'd be all sorts of things that would happen because of that, right? In Paul's day, for those of you who know a little bit about the early church, it was treacherous. It was such a hard world that they lived in. So our worlds are, are drastically different, but in reality, we're, we're all going through a really tough time in life so often, but you want to know what's even more difficult than going through life. It's going through life on your own. Going through life, pretending as if you have everything you need in and of yourself to accomplish what you need in life. Or, or trusting your own voice, the voices in your own head. Or trusting the voices of your friend circle. Or trusting the voices on the internet and never actually stopping to pause to ask God, what in the world do you want me to do? It, it sounds so simple. To, to ask God, he knows your heart, and just to stop and say, God, what do you want me to do in this situation? And that's why I think Paul is saying, I'm confident. Because the same God I have access to, you have access to. Even though I'm not there to teach you, I know who lives in you and among you, and I know who you're listening to. It's God's Spirit, and if you search out the Spirit, you'll have everything you need. I do think that that's why Paul's been spending so much time talking about unity in the book of Romans. Uh, how many of you have come to church week after week and you keep saying, wow, Paul just keeps going on about disputable matters, doesn't he? He just keeps on talking about being unified. Why, why is he talking so much about this? Well, it's pretty simple. It's because he wants the Spirit to work in their community. He, he wants them to take a hold of the thing that they have access to. Um, and, and so he's not afraid because he knows that they have the Spirit. He's not afraid to speak to them boldly because he knows that they can handle it. It says this in verses 15 and 16. He says, Yet I have written you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. What is Paul talking about? Well, he's saying that he doesn't just have some random interest in the gospel. It's not like this is one of his hobbies that he has. Uh, he, he's saying that to reach out and proclaim the good news of Jesus to a group of people is something that he received as a grace in his life. Another way of putting that is he, he received it as something of a calling, quite literally a calling from Jesus, uh, to bring good news to people who have never heard good news before. Uh, some scholars think that the book of Galatians is the oldest of Paul's letters. And if you open up to the book of Galatians, you get some of Paul's backstory in the first couple of chapters. And part of that is him telling the leaders of the church. So, so think of Peter and James and John, these people who were the leaders of the ancient church. He's telling them that he's been called. And, and this is what it says in Galatians chapter 2. He says, for, this is 
Paul speaking now. He says, For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the Jews, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, which is another name for Peter, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. Now, now catch this. When they recognized the grace that had been given to me. So these, these church leaders had recognized the grace that was given to Paul. And he says, they agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. So Paul had this calling on his life to be a bringer of good news to the Gentiles, to people who did not know God. In his context, that just meant non-Jewish people. And that's why Paul's been writing to Gentiles for so long in the book of Romans. But in our day, it means living out the good news and speaking it plainly, living it plainly for people who do not know Jesus at all. I, I find that half the people that I meet in my life and throughout the years are people who have this church background, right? They, they grew up in church. They might have been really close uh, with God at some point. They might have even been following God. They might have called themselves a Christians, but, but then they experienced something from people in the church, and they just decided, you know what? It's not for me, and they, and they left in some way. And then the other half of people that I meet are people who have never, all they know about Jesus is what they've learned through pop culture, all right? So they know a little bit about Christmas, and they know a little bit about Easter, but that's, that's about it. And we think that that's really distant from Paul's world. Well, let me tell you that most of the people that Paul met in his world had no idea what he was talking about at first. He, he actually had to learn how to speak it in a way that made sense to them in their worldview. Acts chapter 17 is a classic example of Paul speaking the gospel in a way that made sense to the people that he was speaking to. There was such a diversity of beliefs and lifestyles and though his world was radically different than ours, I, I want to say, I, I think it wasn't actually all that different from our world that we live in. And this is part of why Paul was focused on spreading the gospel all throughout his world. I want you to hear this quote um, from N.T. Wright. He's a New Testament scholar. He's also a Pauline scholar, so he studies Paul's life. This is from his um, book, Paul, a biography. He says, Paul's mission was not simply about persuading people to believe in Jesus, as though starting from a blank slate, it was about declaring to the non-Jewish nations that the door to their prison stood open and that they were free to leave. Isn't that an incredible way to see it? Paul, when he was interacting with people, he knew his own inner prison that Jesus had literally broke him out of. And Paul had spent a lot of time in actual prison too and had been broken out of it by the Spirit of God as well. He knew the the prisons that, that each one of us has. And he was willing to speak into it and tell people that the doors to the prison, because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, they, they now stand wide open. That because Jesus is not in the grave anymore, I mean, just think of that. Jesus isn't in there anymore. Death couldn't hold him anymore. And so because of that, it, it literally changes everything. It means that the powers, the old powers that used to rule our life, that dominated our life, are no longer in control anymore. They're no longer in control, in control. So it's good news on the one hand because the old powers are no longer in control. But what so often happens in those situations is that when the old powers have been taken out, there's actually a power vacuum. And so there's good news on the other side as well. Because what it is, is that it's the good news in the sense that it's the way that Jesus' loving rulership now comes and takes place in your life. And that's what Paul has been spending so much time in the book of Romans fleshing out. He, he's been fleshing out the fact that Jesus in his love is the thing that sits at the center of your life. That's actual good news. That's not just good information, that's good news. That means that everything in our life changes. This is what the gospel hinges on. I want to read these words, you know them, from John chapter 3, but I want to read them because it's so central to what the good news is. It says that, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now hear these words. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world 
through him. Now, if that's true, if that's true, it's true not just for the Jews of his time. It's true for everyone. For everyone. And if it's for everyone, then there's a question that I want each of us to consider this morning as we move forward. The question is this. How is God going to communicate this good news to the world? The answer is through communicators like Paul. It's through messengers like Paul, people who know their calling from God. They see how they, Jesus has uniquely prepared them. I want to think about, I want each of us to think about our lives. How has Jesus uniquely prepared your life in the situation that you live in to carry this good news about Jesus into your sphere of influence? How has he called you? He's wired you differently than any other person to be a person who brings good news to the people around you. Now, in Paul's day, those people were called priests. They're called priests, and Paul's going to get into the fact that he's actually been made a priest. He's been made a person that's going to carry the good news into his world. In the Old Testament, there were priests. Uh, one of the classic examples is Moses. So Moses is a person who goes up on the mountain, and the people are down, and they build a golden calf. And then what happens when he comes back down the mountain? They're all worshiping the calf, and God is about to wipe out the people, and yet Moses stands as a priest in between God and the people. He talks to God, and he actually changes God's mind about the people. That's what a priest is. So there's priests like that. There's the high priest that was in Israel that was like that. It was a, it's an intermediary. It's a person who talks to God on behalf of the people and a person who talks to the people on behalf of God. But then there's a whole class of priests that we see in the Old Testament as well. But then there was a third set of priests as well. And this one is the one that we oftentimes forget about. I want to read from Exodus chapter 19. It says, you, speaking to the whole nation, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And, and then, in case you think it goes away, no, it's still there in the New Testament. Here's, this is from 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And so there was a high priest, and there was a kingdom of priests. But here's the crazy thing. Israel was supposed to be a nation of priests. They were supposed to go out into the world, and wherever they went, if people were asking the question, what is God like? All they had to do was look at the people of Israel. And, and Paul makes a connection, and Peter makes a connection in the New Testament. You know who that is now? It's you. It's you. It's the church that, that is actually a kingdom of priests. You are, you are what people are going to see when they wonder, what is Jesus like? So many of them are never going to open up a Bible. You're never going to find him in pop culture, but you will find his followers all over the world, and that is the best example of who Jesus is. And Paul says it in verse 16. He says, he gave me the priestly duty proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Who is God going to touch? Whose life is he going to touch because of your presence in their life? So we read something like that, and we read about Paul's life, and, and honestly, so many of us, we just think, I can never do that. I can never be like Paul. Uh, and I want you to let you know that when we choose to follow Jesus, we become in the same family of priests that Paul was a part of. Which is to say that when you follow Jesus, your vision immediately goes outward. Your vision immediately goes outward. It, it immediately starts asking the question, okay, Paul was given the grace to preach to the Gentiles, to bring them into the family of God. God, what are you calling me to do? What are you calling me to do? What grace have you given me? And, and the amazing thing about that old priestly system, that old way God used to, to reach down and communicate with people, you know in the New Testament, they talk about a temple. They talk about a priestly system. But they talk about you being the temple. They, they talk about you being the temple, that that's where people come and meet with God. You are the dwelling place of the Spirit. You are a conduit. 
There's a really great photo. This is riveting stuff, you guys. Um, a conduit. This is actually the image I want us to use this morning, to keep in your mind, because I, th I think it was the best way I could think of to describe what happens in the church. Because conduit is pretty amazing. I did not think about conduit growing up at all. It wasn't until we bought a house and we turned on the hot water the first day and there was no hot water. And my dad, who can do everything, came over and said, yep, you need a new water heater. And I said, could you do that for me? And he said, no, but I'll teach you how to do it. And so we went downstairs and he started explaining what was happening in the conduit. And I was like, oh, this makes a lot of sense. There's natural gas, there's cold water, this thing's supposed to bring, make hot water, and then, and then it can send hot water all throughout the house. It's pretty cool. I mean, it makes sense. I just had never thought about it before. But when you think about it, conduit is great. When it's set up in the right place, when it's connected to the main water source or to whatever is flowing through it, it's really, really great. It also has valves that you can turn off so that you can you know, work on certain parts of the house at, at certain times. And these things are built to be controlled and adjusted and to operate the way that they're supposed to operate. And just thinking back on all of the projects now I've done in my house, I think, man, if the conduit was in the wrong place or if it, if it was closed off, none of this stuff would work. None of it would work. And this is the image that I have of the church as I start to read this passage, that we, like Paul, are set up like conduit. Now, think about us this morning. Like, the conduit's a little messy because we're all just right here. But think about as you leave. Think about as you go to your house. Think about as you go to your work. Or think about as you meet with people throughout the week, that all of a sudden, the conduit is being set up in a very different place. And, and, and you are probably, in some of those cases, the only person in a particular place that knows Jesus. You are set up in a particular place. Uh, but if we, if we only work, if we are connected to the main source of power, we only work if we're connected to the main source of power, and if we're able to be open and allow the Spirit of God to flow in us, and through us, we have to be open to what God is doing. We need to be connected to what he's doing. And that's why Paul has been stressing so much this idea of unity. He's not conflict avoidant. If you Go read Galatians 2 and you'll learn that Paul is not conflict avoidant. He has no problem with conflict. He, he's stressing unity so much in Romans because when we disagree, we prove that it's not the same spirit flowing through all of us. We prove to the world that we are not connected to one, to one another, but when we see ourselves as connected, like the way that conduit is, like interlocking pieces, all open, all on mission together, in our context, in our corners of the world that we inhabit, then we start to show the world what Jesus looks like. That's what we start to show the world. Remember, people are not going to see Jesus in culture for the most part, not in the, in the majority of culture, but they will see you. They see it when we are all together, all connected to the source of God's Spirit. And that's what Paul is saying here. In verse 16, he says that, that proclaiming the gospel turns those who don't know Jesus into offerings for God. It's a beautiful image. Then he goes on in verses 17 and 19. He says, Therefore I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done, by the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit of God. I want you to notice how often he's talking about himself here and things that he's accomplishing. It's not happening is it? He, he's talking, he's pointing the finger back to God all the time. He's saying, look at all the things that God has done, the signs and wonders, the power of his spirit, that this is God's doing. This is all God accomplishing these things in you. And that actually helps take the stress off, does it not? You do not have to muster some sort of knowledge or some sort of wisdom that, that's going to convince someone. All you have to do is stay connected and be open to what God is doing in your life. And so the question that I have for you this morning is from verse 17. It's, what service to God do you have? How are you connected to the body? I mean, think about it. 
Think about it right now. How are you connected to the body? Paul's mission was to the Gentile world. And, and let me simplify this. Sometimes we over-spiritualize this question of calling or, or, or how it is that God has gifted us. Let me simplify it. Ask yourself this question. Where have I been specifically gifted to be in relationship with people? If I go back to the teaching music lesson um, example that I brought up earlier, for me, it was a gift that God had given me for music. And, and as I was leading a youth ministry back at my old church, um, as students keep on getting older, they go through middle school and high school, it became harder and harder to keep people engaged in what was going on because life just tends to get busy. There's homework, there's sports, there's a lot going on. So I started asking this question of where are the relationships? Where am I connecting? And I found that our youth ministry grew with all of the students who are involved in music and who are involved in the youth band. And, and it was because of this. It was because God had given me a gift and I was asking the question of how am I connecting relationally with that gift? Where is that point of connection for you? Where is that point of connection for you? Because here's the big idea today. Being connected to the good news transforms your life into good news. Being connected to the good news transforms your life into the good news. I, I think so often we read the Bible or we have these unfair expectations that I need to like walk people down a certain line and teach them this and then this and then this. And that's great when you're doing discipleship in a relationship like that. But I think what's actually true is that being connected to Jesus and then being connected to other people in relationship allows the good news of God to flow through you. You will find opportunities. You, you, when you're open to what God's Spirit is doing in you, you will sense when you're supposed to say something, when you're supposed to do something. Or think of it this way. If one side of, of you is connected to Jesus and the power of his Spirit flows through you, where is the point of connection on the other side? I hope something is already coming to mind for you. Who are you connected and called to? For Paul, he was headed in the direction of the Gentiles. And that's why in verse 19, he speaks of the fact that he has preached all the way from Jerusalem, all the way around the Mediterranean Sea. You can see a map of where Paul has gone. Now, how many of you ever looked at a map like that in your Bible? And you start saying, that's a lot of traveling. And there's a lot of stories that go with all that travel. One of the things that Paul did, so he started there on the eastern part of the Mediterranean, uh, and then went all the way around, uh, almost up into Rome. Eventually, he finally did get to Rome. And these were places that people had never heard of Jesus before. These were places where Paul felt specifically called by the Spirit who was leading him there. Uh, go and read about his life, because there's one thing you will find when you read about Paul's life, and it's that where he was leading was not an easy journey. Where God was leading him was not easy. He had so many hardships and trials. His calling was not easy. It led him into all kinds of pain. But it's amazing what happens. I hope you can think of this. I hope you've experienced this. And if you haven't, ask God to experience it this week. Because it's amazing once you have heard in your own spirit, from God's spirit, what he is calling you to do, you will find that God is gifting you to have all kinds of perseverance in those situations. You will find a supernatural perseverance that is happening. Uh, it's like the illustration that I began with today, that once you're convinced of it, once you become convinced of where God is calling you, you, you realize that you have everything you need in order to accomplish it. And so I want to wind down today by simply drawing our attention uh, to the three places in this passage where Paul mentions the gospel, because that's what this is all about. It's about absorbing the gospel, experiencing the good news about Jesus, and then going out. He mentions it three times, these three different dimensions of the gospel. The first is in verse 16, where he mentions the priestly duty, which is, again, that's you out in the world, that the way that people are going to experience Jesus is through you, the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel. There was also this geographic reality, which is to say that once you've become convinced that God has put on your heart where it is he's calling you, you and what it is he's calling you to do, your feet usually start to move a little bit. I think it's pretty rare that God calls you and then tells you to sit in your basement. Probably not what he's calling you to all the time, although there's times for rest as well, right? But 
oftentimes there's a geographical reality. Is it taking me across the world? Is it taking me just down the street? Is it taking me someplace in between? And then, then in verse 20, Paul, he talks about this personal drive fueled by the Spirit, the personal drive fueled by the Spirit of proclaiming the gospel. What you'll find is that when you've been called to something, you'll find that you just have a drive to do it. It's not like a passing fad. It's not here one week and then gone the next week. It's something that God is calling you into. So you might have heard sermons like this before about calling, but I want to encourage you for just a second because in the church, what we oftentimes do is look at pastors or preachers or Christian influencers or worship leaders, and we look at them, and we look at the way that God has called them, and then we set it up in our mind that I could never do that. That's not me. Or I could never do what Paul did. And you want to know something? You're right. You could never do what Paul did. Actually, thank God that you are not doing what Paul did, because you'd be terrible at it. Because God has not called you to do what he called Paul to do. He is calling you to do what he's calling you to do. Uh, I've been taking this class on preaching with Kerry uh, Newhoff. Some of you might know him. He's from a Canadian pastor and preacher. And uh, in the question and answer section of one of these sessions, somebody asked him a question. What would you say to young people in their 20s who are just starting to preach, just starting to step into their calling? He had a great response. He, He said three words. He said, get secure fast. He said, get secure fast. Don't spend all of your time looking at everybody else and what they're doing and how God is calling them and what they're on mission for and wondering about how God could possibly do that for you. He said, get secure fast in what God is calling you to do because it's going to be different. How do you get secure fast? Spend some time asking God, what are you calling me to Where does this gospel need to go in my world, in my daily life, at my job, at my school, in my relationships? Who is it around me that has no idea that the prison doors of their life have been broken open? And how do you want me to communicate that to them? Uh, Some of us, we also think Paul was called and then he was changed the next day. And he was changed or that he started preaching to to churches the very next day, we forget it probably took him about 10 years, most scholars think, from the time of his calling until he started going on missionary journeys. 10 years, can you believe that? In the book of Galatians, it talks about the fact that he went to Arabia, to the desert, for three years to get a confirmation of his calling. And that was for a guy who Jesus literally talked to him and came to him in a vision. So here's how I want to encourage you. Some of us today, we don't have three years. We don't even have three minutes of silence in our life. Our lives are so busy, are so full, that we rarely take time to just sit. And so I want to invite you to something. It was on the announcements today, but I want to invite you to the worship night this week. Not only because I'm the director of worship, I mean, that is part of it. I think you're going to have a great time. But some of us sitting here today, we don't spend much time asking God and then waiting on God and expecting, just saying, God, I'm here, I'm open, I'm willing, speak to me. Tell me what it is you're calling me to. Tell me what it is you would want me to do. So that's my invitation. Come to the worship night. You don't even have to sing the songs. You don't have to make anything. You can sit right in the back. You can say, tonight, I'm just listening. I'm just listening to God. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And that's my invitation. And if you can't come, it's okay. But find time this week. For, uh, people who are married, look at your spouse. This week, give them an hour. Give them an hour. Say, I don't want to see you for an hour. Go talk with God. What a gift. What a gift that would be this week. And my encouragement is wherever you're at that you would step into that this week. Would you pray with me? God, it's not always easy knowing just exactly what is the way that you want this gospel message to go out. We know you need people to proclaim it. We know you need people to live it. And so this morning... 
what we are saying is that we are open. We want to be connected to you. We want to be connected to each other. We're open to what it is you want to do. And so the desire of our heart is that you come and move in us this morning, Lord. Uh, I just pray for all of the many obstacles that stand in our way, uh, the obstacles that we can already think of that stand in our way. And I'm, I'm praying right now that you would be the one who knocks those obstacles down. We pray that you would make a way in our lives where we don't feel like there's a way. And give us a willingness and a joy to remain in that calling, Lord. We thank you so much in advance for what it is you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.